Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon. Good evening, depending on what part of the world you're joining us from. You're very welcome to this final day of Sky Day 2021. I'm Karen Coleman, a journalist and a broadcaster from Ireland, and I'm facilitating this conference. And so now it's time for the Euro Surveillance Seminar on Epidemiology and Immunology from Observation to Explanation and Public Health Action. And of course, I'm sure you know this, but Eurosurveillance is a European peer-reviewed scientific journal devoted to the epidemiology, surveillance, prevention and control of communicable diseases with a focus on topics that are of relevance to Europe. It's a weekly online journal featuring short, rapid communications and then longer in-depth research articles, surveillance and outbreak reports, reviews and perspective papers. And it's been published by the ECDC since 2007. And so this year it's celebrating its 25th anniversary. Now this session will be chaired by Dr. Daniel levy Bruhl, a medical epidemiologist and COVID-19 expert within the Infectious Diseases Department of Santé Publique in France. But first, I'm going to hand over to Inish Steffens, the editor of Eurosurveillance. And Inish is joining us now from the ECDC studios in Stockholm. Good morning to you, Inish. You're very welcome to our virtual stage. And I'm going to hand over to you now. Many thanks and good morning, good day to everyone. As the Editor-in-Chief of Eurosurveillance, I'm very happy to be here on behalf of the whole small but dedicated team to welcome you to our anniversary seminar. The last 25 years have been an exciting journey for the journal and we had great support in this from many of you. I would just like to take this opportunity to thank you, to thank the speakers in our seminar today, to thank the moderator that they have accepted our invitation, and to all our partners, contributors, and our audience for their trust in the journal over a quarter of a, of a century. You praise us, but you also challenge us, and please keep on challenging us because it's good to know what you expect from the journal so we can match your needs. A special thanks goes also to those of you who act as our advisors, to the board members who are all across Europe, to our editorial advisors, our associate editors, and also the many unnamed experts who are out there and who listen to us and who have an ear for us and who are also there to give us advice when we need it. You encourage us in your, our day-to-day -day action and you also inspire our strategic thinking. Last but not least, we are of course grateful to our colleagues here at ECDC and our publisher, the ECDC, for their support and for giving us editorial independence, which allows us, which provides space, room and the motivation, gives us motivation to go the extra mile so we can provide sound quality evidence for public health action and the policy making. And I'm very thankful that our director, Andrea Amon, has made space in her very, very busy diary and agenda to give a welcome note to us today on this special occasion. So, Andrea, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ines. And um, I would like to welcome you from my side also to this seminar. Um, which actually is a very specific seminar and very special, as you, as, you, uh, as you know. We celebrate 25 years today uh, of the journal's public health impact and 10 years uh, of it among being uh, among the 10 top uh, infectious disease journals. Initially, uh, Eurosurveillance was set up as an outlet for the surveillance networks, which I think only veterans of European surveillance like myself still remember um, when uh, the, at the, the beginning of European surveillance, the, uh, uh, it was done via your uh, commission funded uh, uh, projects before it fa uh, all these found a home in TESI. Now, I have to say, um, uh, as a former board member and now as director, I am very pleased uh, uh, on, the, on, the, on the long road that the journal has come. 
Um, it currently ranks eighth in among the journals in the category infectious diseases and has remained among the top 10 ranked cited journals in this field for the 10 years that we uh, have applied now for the, for the impact factor for this, which is, of course, a very critical um, uh, element for, for all journals nowadays. So many in the uh, audience, and uh, that includes myself, have been involved with the journal in different ways as readers, as authors, as reviewers. We have acted as informal advisors uh, or in a more formal role as board members. Uh, the strong and growing network uh, of contributors, not only from across Europe, but really uh, beyond Europe uh, uh, globally, has been and will hopefully remain a strength of the journal. Eurosurveillance has uh, published and uh, uh, will hopefully continuously uh, publish authoritative and sound evidence for immediate and long-term public health action. Uh, there is ample written and anecdotal evidence of this. On the occasion of this anniversary, the editors have created a collection of articles suggested by board members and contributors that illustrate the impact of over the years. Now, there was one feature that really distinguished uh, Euro surveillance, um, and uh, that is the, uh, the speed of the rapid communication. Uh, it was such a distinguished feature that many journals are um, uh, copying this now with fast track uh, uh, procedures uh, that they have. Now, uh, an example for this is that uh, on 23rd of January last year, uh, at the very onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, when the causing virus still was named 2019 novel coronavirus, the editors were able to publish two fully peer-reviewed uh, articles by prominent virologists from across Europe and scientists from Hong Kong. Now, what will the future bring? What uh, will be expected from a journal like your surveillance? Translation of knowledge and the increased interdisciplinarity are two uh, key aspects that we have learned now also during this pandemic and uh, that are part of the uh, journal's um, long-term strategy. Um, when we, when we uh, transferred Eurosurveillance to ECDC, there were very um, critical concerns about the editorial independence. And uh, I, in, in, in the time that I was uh, director, I made really sure that uh, I, I kept away from the, uh, from the uh, decisions of the journal, the editorial decisions. So I learn every Thursday what is published. The decision is alone with Ines and the editorial team. Now, the independence is, of course, ending when, the res when it comes to resources. So uh, here, your surveillance is depending on the resources that ECDC has available. And uh, that is uh, something that we, uh, or I, um, really carefully consider. The success of your surveillance is uh, due to the dedication of many people, um, of the authors, of the reviewers, the board members, and the associate editors. But in particular, it's uh, uh, the willingness of the editorial team to go the extra mile day by day that keeps the, the journal uh, uh, there. Um, the willingness to uh, uh, not compromise on the um, uh, editing process, on the scientific evidence, on the need to also give 
uh, authors that may not have so much experience in publishing yet, um, the a place and a voice when they have something important to say. And I'm really grateful for this team to be part of your surveillance and I hope they will continue for a long time to do so. So congratulations, heartfelt congratulations from my side and I hand now over to Daniel levy -Brühl. Uh, Andrea, first I'd like to thank uh, your surveillance and more specifically you, Ines, for your confidence in proposing me this role of moderator. It's indeed a great honor and pleasure for me, especially since this program is particularly attractive and the uh, subject very topical. Indeed, uh, the current COVID-19 crisis has clearly demonstrated the need to rely on immunological expertise to best define the COVID-19 vaccination strategies in the context of uh, so many uncertainties regarding both new pathogen and innovative vaccines platforms. However, the contribution of uh, immunology to understand the epidemiology of uh, infectious disease and the impact of control measures, especially vaccination, does not date from 2020. The three aspects that we will deal with, uh, guiding vaccination policy, understanding the impact of the occurrence of a disease on other pathogens and trying to explain intriguing and disappointing effect of vaccination will be illustrated by each of the three speakers. In the case of COVID-19, we didn't have, of course, much time to observe, then explain, and lastly, take action. But the two other examples, which are related to two old acquaintances, namely measles and influenza, clearly illustrate how unexpected epidemiological finding, in one case favorable, but in the other case detrimental, led to explore the immunological underlying mechanism and eventually strengthen and, if, and potentially question the current vaccination strategy. Okay, I will stop here for the introduction. It's time to let our three speakers take us to the very complex and fascinating battle between pathogen on one side and the host immune defenses on the other side. They will have 15 minutes each for the presentation, which will allow us for 10 minute discussion after each talk. You can use the uh, use chat box as you have already done the last days to ask questions. Uh, and I will be, of course, your, your go between. So the first speaker is uh, Dr. Danuta Skowronski. She is the epidemiological lead responsible for surveillance, rapid response research and program and policy recommendation for influenza and emerging respiratory pathogen at the British Columbia Center for Disease Control. Of note, she is considered as having pioneered the test negative design, a very elegant epidemiological design globally now adopted to monitor influenza vaccine effectiveness. And as you have all note, which has been widely used this year for COVID-19 vaccine effectiveness measurement. I thank her for accepting the invitation of your surveillance, especially taking into account the fact that uh, she has a I don't know if I should say that it's very late in the evening or early in the in the morning for you. So thank you very, very much. Uh, your speak will be an immunological uh, imprinting with the example of uh, influenza. So Danuta, the floor is yours. Uh, thanks very much and hello everybody. I'm uh, very pleased to participate in uh, this anniversary session uh, with Eurosurveillance. I know within Canada we have very much appreciated the rapid response uh, peer review and publications through Eurosurveillance, so a great pleasure for me to participate in this session. Uh, in this uh, presentation, I'm going to be reinforcing once again why first impressions matter most. Uh, I'll be illustrating uh, birth cohort effects 
defined by immunological imprinting to childhood influenza exposures. And uh, I do hope that the long uh, and hard lessons learned with uh, influenza virus may be uh, applicable uh, and useful in our uh, response to uh, SARS-CoV-2 as well. Um, and so, uh, I will start by giving some background what I mean by birth cohort effects, which are really uh, age and period interactions. So we're aware of uh, age effects that may be a developmental, uh, behavioral or physiological changes associated with aging. You might think of immune immaturity in neonates or immunosenescence with uh, uh, aging, social contacts in school children, so variations by age per se. Uh, period effects are widespread uh, environmental exposures at a circumscribed point in time. You might think of floods, for instance, or fires, uh, uh, but you might also think about pandemics as period effects or uh, epidemics. Uh, uh, due to drifts in influenza to which people are exposed over a finite period of time. Well, cohort effects are basically a combination of period effects that are expressed differentially by age, and those may have short-lived or uh, long-term uh, consequences. Um, I do want to also give some background for those of you who may not be so familiar with influenza virus, which is a, a highly changeable virus. It's, ch it's characterized foremost by this changeability. It's a constantly uh, evolving, uh, re-emerging RNA virus. And we define the influenza virus, we categorize them based on a surface glycoprotein called the hemagglutinin. And in particular, the antibody response is driven toward the immunodominant hemagglutinin head where there are some pivotal five in fact uh, antigenic sites where major changes occur in the influenza virus as it evolves to evade our immunity and the influenza virus as a glyco uh, with the hemagglutinin protein which is a, a glycoprotein uh, uh, evolves in that uh, uh, hemagglutinin head uh, also also through gain or loss of glycosylation, which can expose or shield those antigenic sites from the immune response. In total, there are uh, 18 subtypes defined based on the hemagglutinin protein on the surface of influenza viruses, with wild aquatic birds considered the reservoir uh, for those various subtypes, uh, bats as well, harboring the H17 and H18 subtypes. And we divide influenza viruses viruses, uh, categorize them uh, phylogenetically into two groups, with group one including uh, a representative H1, H2, H5 viruses, and group two including H3 representative uh, H7 viruses also. And keep those in mind for later in the presentation where I'll be referencing interactions that occur within groups, uh, uh, within groups group one and within uh, group two. And uh, influenza viruses uh, are also characterized by uh, periodic pandemics due to major changes in the uh, hemagglutinin protein on the surface of the virus, followed by seasonal epidemics, or what we refer to as drifts. So on, on between 1918 uh, until 1957, H1 uh, viruses circulated, 1957 to 1968, H2, both of those being, again, group one viruses. And after 1968, H3 viruses emerged, which are H2. 1977, we saw introduction of H1 again, and those uh, have co circulated since 1977, the H3 and the H1, so both group one and group two viruses co-circulating. But this virus then is, is characterized by these periodic pandemics followed by uh, seasonal epidemics or drift. 
and virtually all of us have had a priming exposure to influenza virus by the age of five years, with children having the highest attack rates estimated at about one in five, then uh, unvaccinated children compared to one in 10 adults having been um, uh, infected. And during pandemics, of course, those attack rates are even higher uh, with, uh, uh, again, highest in children, ranging about 40 to 50 percent, for instance, during the 2009 pandemic having been uh, infected. So if you think that the um, uh, 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 priming exposures uh, occur then in children during pandemics. We have broad swaths of the population that become primed with a, uh, a single influenza virus and its epitopes, and those leave signatures then in the population uh, defined by those priming epitopes. And indeed, the first influenza infection uh, is a very significant lifetime event. It creates the largest back ground pool long-lasting memory cells, uh, epitope-specific immune B cell and T cell memory uh, clones, and uh, driving antibodies, mostly again targeting the immunodominant hemagglutinin head. And subsequent influenza exposures then preferentially recall or back boost memory responses to those earliest uh, priming epitopes. And uh, Thomas Francis uh, recognized the importance of that and invoked cohort effects, in fact, in the population defined by those uh, uh, early childhood priming exposures. And, and he referred to the imprints established by the original virus infection that governs the antibody response thereafter as original antigenic sin. Now, he, he was uh, the son of a Presbyterian minister so he invoked this sort of theological reference to this biological phenomenon. It was a bit off-putting, actually, to refer to these cohort effects as somehow sinful or necessarily detrimental or untoward. Uh, but I think the concept of these uh, lasting imprints driven by early childhood exposure and this predominant response to that uh, early uh, influenza exposure throughout lifetime was a key concept. But I think during the 2009 pandemic in particular, we recognized that these imprints um, that are made by the early childhood exposure are not always necessarily sinful. Sometimes, in fact, it can be a virtue, a benefit to the population. And this was revealed for us and many others uh, in 2009 when we saw that very old individuals, in fact, 90% of those uh, 90 years of age in our analyses had pre-existing immunity to the 2009 uh, novel H1N1 virus. And that came from, we believe, a lasting cross-reactivity induced by exposure to related ancestral viruses in childhood, the 2009 pandemic being closely related phylogenetically to viruses that circulated between 1918 and 1930. And those back boosts, those recall responses, in fact, served the elderly very well during the 2009 pandemic. Now, it's not to say that all is rosy in terms of immunological imprinting. We did also during the 2009 pandemic identify indeed untoward effects of possible immunological interactions with uh, uh, recipients of the 2008-9 seasonal influenza vaccine, in fact, repeat vaccinees being protected against seasonal viruses during that 2008-9 season. But when the 2009 pandemic arose in April of 2009, we identified that those repeat recipients of seasonal influenza vaccine were at about twice the risk of the 2009 pandemic. And we invoked those uh, 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 imprinting phenomena that Francis referred to as original antigenic sin as one hypothesis to explain that uh, unexpected finding of increased risk associated with prior repeat seasonal vaccine receipt. And subsequent to the 2009 pandemic, we have since uh, observed under similar conditions of repeat vaccination with uh, similar vaccine strains 
vaccine in the context of big antigenic mismatch to circulating variants, the uh, uh, finding of uh, uh, reduced vaccine protection and even during the 2014-15 season, again, increased risk associated with repeat vaccination in the context of big antigenic mismatch. So these immunological interactions that are much more complex, in fact, than we had previously uh, appreciated, notwithstanding the fact that uh, Francis had raised the specter of this back uh, in 1960. And the 2009 pandemic and the recognition of both beneficial, uh, in addition to potential negative effects of imprinting also, I think, opened uh, minds to explore in what other ways imprinting may have influenced some long-standing questions in the influenza world, including, for instance, why was the 1918 pandemic so devastatingly bad uh, for young adults? And in this paper by Warby, they hypothesized, well, perhaps it was because uh, uh, young adults in 1918 had as their imprinting printing virus, their priming exposure, a group two H3 virus uh, during the uh, 1890 uh, pandemic, uh, which they hypothesized was H3N8 inducing immunity, priming immunity in those young adults who when exposed to the H1N1 virus in 1918 may have had an untoward consequence of their original priming exposure in childhood. These are concepts that the influenza world had been resistant to for quite a long time until the 2009 pandemic showed that there were positive benefits of imprinting as well. And uh, others have subsequently also explored not only how imprinting may explain past pandemics, but potential future pandemics due to other novel uh, uh, influenza viruses such as H5 or H7. And in this rather um, interesting uh, paper originally by Gostick and then translated also by Vibu and Epstein, they explain that uh, individuals who have had their priming exposure to group one viruses, in fact, H1 or H2 between 1918 and 1968, have a paucity of H5 cases, with H5 cases being much older, in fact, than uh, H7 cases. And they are hypothesizing that this is due to uh, cross protection from priming exposures to H1 or H2 group one viruses protecting against H5 in um, uh, the uh, older individuals. Conversely, for H7, another potential influenza pandemic uh, virus that we are closely monitoring, the cases tend to be older, whereas younger individuals who have been primed to group two viruses, in other words, H3 viruses, have cross protection and immunity uh, against H7. So these are now concepts that are really uh, fundamentally based on an understanding of immunological imprinting and their effects on um, other influenza viruses. And we're also seeing legacy effects from the 2009 pandemic, uh, uh, positive protective uh, effects. And you can see, for instance, in this paper that we uh, examined cohort effects published in Eurosurveillance, that uh, children aged 10 to 19 years who were alive through the 2009 pandemic um, were rel are relatively underrepresented amongst H1N1 cases shown in turquoise relative to the general population represented by the gray bars, whereas children five to nine years of age over successive H1 epidemics have become increasingly overrepresented. These are kids who would not have been alive during the 2009 pandemic, are not benefiting from the immunity uh, that other age groups had acquired. And so that by the 2018-19 pandemic, you can see that they are largely overrepresented amongst cases. And you might think ahead to subsequent uh, epidemics of H1N1 when these school-aged children enter the preteens and teens of the richest social context, uh, what then uh, the age distribution of H1N1 epidemics may uh, look like. 
And we've also seen some, again, untoward effects following the H1N1 uh, 2009 pandemic as that virus continues to evolve in the way that influenza viruses do after a pandemic has occurred through seasonal epidemics. And in this paper, we observed a curious variation, age-related variation in vaccine effectiveness in a season of antigenic mismatch between the vaccine and circulating virus. And what we were able to show was this variation in age may have been related to variation, in fact, in imprinting, with the influenza H1N1 virus having um, changed from a lysine at position 163 to a glutamine uh, at that position, that pivotal position in the hemagglutinin head, that may have uh, compromised vaccine response in middle-aged adults who had been imprinted to lysine at that position 163. And when the vaccine was uh, remained lysine, but the virus, circulating virus, had changed to a glutamine at that position 163, we see this dip in the vaccine effectiveness. Again, uh, we hypothesized may be related to differential imprinting in that age band compared to other age bands. And of interest, the US colleagues saw a similar dip in uh, vaccine effectiveness in that particular age group. So it was no longer a matter of simple vaccine mismatch with contemporary circulating virus, but these differential effects also based on uh, the imprinting virus that the individuals had been exposed to. And this, I think, may blow your minds a little bit. I know that it did for us when we first identified it, this um, uh, um, uh, observation in the 2018-19 season that led us to hypothesize some very interesting effects, paradoxical effects may have been due to what we coined imprint-regulated effect of vaccine. Again, novel findings that uh, we're very grateful to your surveillance for having uh, uh, published. But in 2018-19, there were two influenza A, H3, and two clades or variants, if you like, that co-circulated uh, called 3C2A1B actually and 3C3A. And the 2A1 viruses are characterized by a tyrosine at position 159 uh, at the top of the hemagglutinin head, whereas the 3A viruses were characterized by a serine at position 159. The vaccine strain that year was a 3C2A1, so it had tyrosine at position 159. 2A1 in circulating viruses are tyrosine, as I say, at position 159, and the circulating viruses are uh, glycosylated, shielding that tyrosine at position 159. But with egg adaptation, egg passage, the vaccine strains are unglycosylated. They become unglycosylated as part of the vaccine manufacturing process, exposing the tyrosine at position 159. As I say, 3A viruses are serine at position 159, so there is a clear mismatch between the 2A1 vaccine strain and the clade 3C3A viruses, which are a serine at that pivotal position in the hemagglutinin head. Well, it so happens that we observed some very interesting age-related variation based on that mismatch and the vaccine effectiveness to 3C3A, which we hypothesize again may be due to differences in imprinting. And I say this because following the 1968 pandemic, H3 viruses that circulated, and you can see uh, we have mapped here the uh, percentage of circulating viruses that bore serine, tyrosine, or phenylalanine at that pivotal position 159 over the years since the 1968 pandemic. And for 30 years following the 1968 pandemic, H3 viruses bore a serine at position 159. Thereafter, tyrosine and then phenylalanine. So in other words, viruses that circulated between 1968 and around 1985, 1986, bore a, 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 a signature of serine at that position. And people who may have been alive, children at the time, would have been imprinted 
to a serine at that position 159. Well, when we looked at the vaccine effectiveness to clade 3C, 3A viruses by age group in 2018-19, and we mapped it according to what they may have been imprinted with as children, you can see that we see this dramatic dip in vaccine effectiveness at around 45 years of age, which corresponds with the period when people would have been imprinted as children long ago, 45 years prior to serine. And this is in the context of vaccine that is a tyrosine at position 159, mismatched to the contemporary 3C3A virus, and also mismatched to the imprint that these children, these individuals, now adults, would have received. And we hypothesized that the unvaccinated individuals had been protected with the imprinted immunity that they received, but receipt of the 2A1 vaccine that was tyrosine somehow interfered with that protection that the unvaccinated would have otherwise had, leading to, in fact, a, a, a three to four-fold increased risk of 3C3A in the vaccinated compared to the unvaccinated. I don't have time to go into it in detail, but an accompanying editorial uh, provided some uh, immunological explanation, again, invoking the back-boosting uh, and preferential recall of the priming uh, uh, antibody uh, response, the priming uh, virus in childhood to uh, potentially explain that um, uh, observation and what we refer to as imprint-regulated effective vaccine. So our, my concluding comments, again, influenza virus is a highly changeable virus. The first influenza infection is a significant lifetime event. And really up until I would say around 2009, we largely ignored the last, uh, lasting immunological legacy of that childhood uh, imprint. On a population level, influenza pandemics with high attack rates in children can induce signature cohort effects that will have uh, uh, lasting Im impacts and will manifest as variation in age-related risk and even vaccine effectiveness over time. To date, annual influenza uh, vaccination recommendations have largely ignored the complex role of that pre-existing immunity. Uh, our recommendations assume that we are all a blank slate each time we show up for our influenza vaccine shot every year. Uh, but that's simply not the case. And there are complex conditions of antigenic relatedness, not just between vaccine doses and the circulating virus, but also the imprinting virus. And influenza vaccine performance has been suboptimal, certainly less than what we're seeing with the SARS-CoV-2 vaccines. And if we want improvement in those vaccines, we have to consider these effects. And Moreover, if we don't want to go down the same path with influenza vaccine that we've been going uh, down uh, with these SARS-CoV-2 vaccines, we need also to consider what might be imprinting effects and their relevance to SARS-CoV-2 vaccination. You've probably seen lots of editorials lately uh, drawing analogies between influenza vaccine, annual influenza vaccine, and uh, the potential need for annual SARS-CoV-2 vaccination in the context of new variants. Um, well, uh, I'm also happy to see that there are uh, expert discussions and publications uh, reflecting upon what might be the uh, impact of immunological imprinting uh, in the context of SARS-CoV-2 vaccine and the smorgasbord of variants that we're starting to see of SARS-CoV-2. Uh, so these are important concepts, I think, lessons learned that we may need also to apply uh, to SARS-CoV-2 vaccination and the questions related to booster doses. So I'll leave it there. That's all that I had to say. And if there's time, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Danuta, for this very brilliant presentation. Uh, we have a few minutes left for questions. As you would expect, there are a lot of questions about the impact of those findings on vaccination strategies, especially for influenza, but also, as you just mentioned, for COVID-19. One question that has been posed by 
more than one person is what may be the long term consequences of childhood influenza immunization and primary influenza in printing? Well, that's an excellent question. And the truth is, we don't know the long term impacts because we have not been immunizing children uh, uh, long enough over successive years to be able to follow. Uh, what those long-term uh, effects uh, may be. Uh, I think while there is a, a, a clear and important risk uh, of influenza uh, burden in the here and now, the uh, tangible evidence, I think, outweighs speculation that way. Uh, and what are the relative effects of vaccination versus infection? Because for sure, uh, uh, unvaccinated by five years of age, as I say, we all will have had an influenza uh, exposure. But what the impact of repeat vaccination over time is only time uh, will tell. And what is most important is that we evaluate that, that we are poised to evaluate it, and that we have open minds about uh, beneficial effects, but also what are the, is the ultimate benefit risk analysis of that over time. Thank you. Um, there are several people asking you to comment a little bit further on the consequences of your finding and COVID-19 vaccination strategy, especially for children or for low-risk adults. Can you say a little bit more? Uh, I think it's important for us to consider the um, uh, similarities uh, between influenza and influenza vaccination, the need for annual repeat, but also the differences uh, between influenza and SARS-CoV-2. Uh, I think we should be open to the possibility that imprinting may play a role. Uh, so far, the uh, existing vaccines uh, are protecting well against most of the variants that have arisen due to SARS-CoV-2. And it will become an issue that we will need to be able to evaluate when we start to see variations that are uh, antigenically important, uh, introduce a uh, mismatch between the vaccine that is uh, antigenically significant and the circulating variants. And when we start to consider repeat boosters, what the periodicity of that uh, will be, what the importance of match to the circulating variants and how that relates to the imprint that very many people uh, will have had either to SARS-CoV-2 infection or now to uh, vaccination. So I don't know the answer. I think it's important mm -hmm. that we are open to the hypothesis and that we are poised to evaluate that and that Really, the important lesson from influenza is not to make assumptions far beyond the available evidence, to collect that evidence and then to be open to whatever that evidence may show us and be guided by that. That for me is what's most important because we, we, don't, we cannot say definitively we know that this will play a role with SARS-CoV at, at, at the current time. Okay, thank you very much, Danuta. I'm, I'm sorry for all those who ask questions. I think we, we, we have to move now. There was a lot of also of congratulation to you for your presentation. I think it's, it's a bit frustrating to, uh, to leave this fascinating field, but there will be other occasions. So now we'll have to move to the next speaker. Thank you again, Danuta, and good night for what remains at least. <laughs> so the next speaker is uh, Dr. Rory De Vries. He's a virologist at the Erasmus Medical Center in Rotterdam in the Netherlands. He's the head of the lab on immunity to respiratory viruses with a focus on measles virus, respiratory syncytial virus, and of course, lately uh, on SARS-CoV-2. His presentation is on immune amnesia following measles. So, Rory, the floor is yours. Great. Uh, thank you, Daniel, for the kind introduction. Also, thanks, Ines, for the invitation to present here. And, uh, I feel a little bit guilty because I haven't published in your survey, and so uh, I feel that that's now on my to-do list to do uh, pretty soon uh, after being here on this anniversary. So, um, well, because time is limited, I'd also like to start. Uh, Danielle already introduced me. I'm a virologist from the Netherlands. Uh, I work at the Rotterdam Medical Center in Rotterdam uh, in the lab of my young Koopmans, who uh, 
published the PCR paper in your surveys. I think it's uh, one of the most published, uh, most cited papers at the moment. But uh, I will not be talking about SARS-CoV-2 today. I'll be talking about measles uh, virus and specifically about the immune amnesia that follows measles virus because we are talking about implications of uh, diseases on immune status here. It will be a little bit more immunological than the previous talk, but that's great, I think, uh, to keep a good mix. So before I start, I would like to give a short background on, on measles because, uh, well, it is a well-known disease, but uh, well, some people seem to forget about measles, which is definitely not a good thing. So uh, measles is the most infectious pathogen in humans. Um, before COVID, uh, people had no idea what the R0 or R0 was, I guess, but uh, after COVID, everyone knows what this number means. And we also know that SARS-CoV-2 uh, is, is around one, and if it's above one in the Netherlands, at least that's a very bad sign. Well, measles is uh, between 12 and 18, so that says something about how infectious the virus is. So it means uh, one uh, infected measles patient can infect 12 to 18 new patients. Of course, that goes for a naive population, which is not always the case in measles, because most people have measles uh, immunity. So uh, measles is a bit special. It has a relatively long incubation time for a respiratory virus, and uh, that is because the pathogenesis is special, and I will talk about the pathogenesis a little bit more later on to, to explain the, the rationale behind, behind our hypothesis of immune amnesia. So the incubation time is, is over a week, close to two weeks, before you get the typical measles symptoms, which are uh, known as rash, but also fever and respiratory tract uh, problems, so often cough and sneezing. Um, however, today we'll be talking about immune suppression, or rather what we uh, like to call immune amnesia. So how measles makes the body forget previous immunity to previous infections, or maybe even vaccination. And that's a topic of speculation later on. And this immune suppression or immune amnesia is a big, um, a big uh, problem. And actually it's a major cause of measles mortality because it leaves measles patients susceptible to all kinds of opportunistic um, infection. So... Um, Measles also uh, causes rare but severe neurological complications. I will not uh, touch upon that today, but I just wanted to mention it. And the one thing I do want to mention, and this is, of course, a really high number. The global mortality for measles is still over 200,000 deaths per year, um, which is insane for a vaccine-preventable disease, I would say. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's definitely a topic of discussion. I'm reporting the 2019 number here for a good reason. Uh, so measles was on the rise, especially in Europe. There was a big measles problem in Eastern Europe. There was a lot of measles outbreaks. Uh, measles cases increased up to the, the COVID-19 pandemic and all kinds of uh, social restrictions and measures have actually uh, also had a good uh, side effect on measles, uh, as we have also seen with influenza and other viruses. Now, although influenza is coming back up, respiratory syncytial virus is coming back up, measles not yet. So uh, there's very little measles circulation in Europe at the moment, but of course uh, there is a, yeah, maybe a, a sort of threat, you can even call it, that there will be recirculation after uh, all restrictions are lifted. So before we go into details on immune amnesia, I just want to touch a little bit up on the virology. So measles is a respiratory virus that causes systemic disease. That's what we always say. So measles virus uh, uses two cellular receptors. One is called SLAM or CD150, and it's not important that you remember these for the rest of the talk. I just want to mention it. The other one is Nectin-4, both were described in papers in Nature. And uh, why is that important? These two receptors explain the tropism of measles virus, so which cells are infected by measles virus as soon as the measles virus enters your body. So this SLAM uh, is expressed mainly on thymocytes, macrophages, and red cells, and lymphocytes, so basically all uh, lymphoid and myeloid cells of the immune system, where Nectin-4 is expressed on epithelial cells. And all these receptors partly explain how the virus comes in. Uh, initially, it infects and it replicates in the lymphoid system and then it spreads to epithelial cells and so it transmits to the next host. And of course this infection of all kinds of immune cells uh, is what we're touching on today because that is definitely affecting your immunity to other viruses as soon as you recover from these virus. So those are the receptors and I also want to talk a little bit about the models uh, that we use because I'm going to show you some, uh, some raw data from experiments, although it's not a lot. So uh, I just want to explain a little bit what we do in Rotterdam before we started doing clinical trials in humans, we, uh, we elucidated the pathogenesis of measles using animal models, and we use recombinant measles viruses that express TFP. And these recombinant measles viruses are fully based on wild type viruses, and they have one additional transcription unit um, uh, that is TFP or another fluoroclone into the genome. Uh, we, of course, validated these viruses that have no, have no effect on virulence. These viruses are not attenuated in any way, but the added benefit is that whenever 
a cell is infected, and this is an example just here, um, this cell turns brightly green. So you can imagine this is a really useful tool to study pathogenesis. And uh, I want to acknowledge Paul Dupre here, who is currently in Pittsburgh, who, uh, who made all these recombinant viruses for us. And we've combined these viruses with our uh, animal model. And uh, for measles, which is a very host-restricted virus, you have to work in primates. So that means that we use a non-human primate animal model uh, to study the immune suppression caused by measles. And the reason I'm showing this picture is because we can also visualize our fluorescent viruses macroscopically. So this is a measles uh, virus infected uh, rhesus macaque in this case uh, before rash. So you don't see rash yet, but you can see because we are using these green fluorescent viruses, we can already follow infection even in vivo in an animal model. So this was a great tool. And this is how we studied immune uh, amnesia initially in monkeys before we went to humans. So what we find in these, uh, in these uh, primate models or non-human primate models is how measles uh, is disseminated throughout the house. So after entry, we infected these monkeys after entry. We took blood uh, between day zero, so this is the day of infection, and two weeks later. And what you see on the y-axis here of all the graphs is the expression of TFP, so infection in different immune cell subsets. And already what this shows in, in peripheral blood, it was mainly CD4 T cells, and B cells that were infected by measles virus. Although you see the infection percentage is not so drastic. So about 3% of the CD4 T cells and 4% of the B cells was infected. Uh, CDH were also targeted a little bit less and monocytes were not infected at all. So in the periphery, it was mainly the lymphoid cells and then especially the CD4 T cells that were affected by, uh, by measles virus. And of course, uh, from that we went to the next step. So we saw, wow, these, uh, these T cells are definitely affected in blood. But what we really want to know is what's happening in the lymphoid tissues, since we know that measles is now a, a lymphoid virus. So uh, we went back to our monkeys, and these are tissues from a, a monkey necropsy. And this is, this pictures are showing you the uh, the intestines, both the small and large intestine. I think these are great pictures to illustrate that the gut-associated lymphoid tissue and the phares patches are in fact and actually, if you look at these pictures closely. You can even see the B cell follicles uh, lighting up fluorescent green. So this is a, a great example how measles is replicating in the lymph nodes of these uh, these monkeys in this case. But you can imagine that this is also going on in humans that are infected with measles virus. So from that we came to our hypothesis: Well, if measles is affecting the immune system that bad, there must be some kind of immune suppression. And we already knew that in measles patients there was always this lymphopenia, and this lymphopenia was transient. And it was often dismissed because there was a transient lymphopenia. People said, well, lymphopenia is transient, so probably this cannot explain uh, uh, immunosuppression. However, we now saw what was going on in lymph nodes. So, um, so we thought, well, we better want to look at these lymphocytes and what's going on in the different lymphocyte populations. So we, um, we came with the hypothesis. So we know that measles is uh, infecting lymphocytes because of the cellular receptor on the surface of lymphocytes. We know also, and I haven't told you this yet, that this receptor CD150 is mainly expressed on the memory cells, uh, memory lymphocytes, so memory B and memory T cells. So these are really the, um, the memory cells that carry the immunological memory. So you can imagine that it's a bad case if a virus is targeting these memory cells specifically. And we also now know that measles is present in BBMC, but it's a relatively low percentage. In lymphoid tissues, there is way more measles. And if we now look in these subpopulations, so the memory cells in lymphoid tissues, there's really high infection percentages of, with measles virus. So, of course, we hypothesize that infection and depletion of these memory cells can explain how measles suppresses the immune system and leaves a uh, host susceptible to an opportunistic infection. So um, we looked a little bit more in depth into these memory cells, and I'm showing you four different locations, anatomical locations of the non human primates, the peripheral blood, but also three different uh, lymphoid tissues, and I don't have to go through these graphs in detail, but what you can see, we compared naive cells and different memory cells, and there was always way more infection in the central and effector of memory cells, both in CD4 and CD8 populations. In B cells, it was no big difference between naive and memory, but there was just high infection percentages in B cells in general. So, uh, while well, this was our first indication that the, the immunological memory was really being targeted by, uh, by measles virus. But we then go to the tissues like physically and we look at the different tissues. And I just want to look you at have you to have a look on the second row. You're looking here at B cell follicles in a, in a, a lymph node, and you're following following those over time between five days after infection and 15 days after infection. And what you see is you see normal B cell follicles pretty early in infection. 
you see some damage in B-cell follicles on day nine, but on day 11, you see pretty drastically that your whole B-cell follicle is basically depleted. There's no more germinal center, there's no more uh, B-cells in there. And of course, this is rapidly uh, recovered after you clear a measles virus because of proliferation that's going on. But you can imagine that this B-cell follicle two weeks after measles has a way more naive uh, or clonal um, expansion uh, phenotype than this B-cell follicle, which is probably very diverse before uh, measles. Okay, so from that, um, I've actually uh, explained most of this, so I want to go to the, the human and clinical studies that we have done. So initially, we started with some uh, clinical correlations and associations. So we looked at um, insult incidence rates uh, of TP consultations after measles, and I don't want to go into too much detail in these studies, but in blue, you always see measles patients. In red, you always see the controls, and what you see is they, these measles patients go to the GP for measles, of course, but also in the, in the period following measles, and this is up to five years after measles, there's increased uh, GP consultations uh, by measles patients. Uh, in accordance with that, this is infections, unrelated infections, but just other infections after measles. Again, in blue, you see the measles patients, and in red, you see the controls. So in general, measles patients after recovery uh, develop more other infections than controls. And also, if you look at antibiotic prescription as a sort of um, a surrogate for infections, you see that measles patients are prescribed in general more antibiotics the five years after measles than the controls. So although these are all associations, there was a clear association that uh, there is more infections going on in measles patients after resolving measles, so underlying or maybe as a sort of foundation uh, for the immune amnesia hypothesis that I'm presenting today. So. Um, so that's that. Um, we also look at timing and we found that this is relevant up to two, three, four, maybe even five years after infection and then the difference uh, levels off. So the last piece I want to show you before uh, I discuss the implications of this is um, a study. We really did an observational study in a measles outbreak in the Netherlands. This outbreak was in 2013 and 2014. And uh, this is in a region of the Netherlands, which is um, a religious region. Uh, so they are unvaccinated and every 10 to 15 years, there's a measles outbreak in this region in the Netherlands. And uh, we decided that we want to do an observational cohort study in this, uh, in this uh, cohort or in this group of people. And they were really uh, happy to help and willing to, to participate in science. So that means that we had uh, or could obtain samples from unvaccinated children and families. And I'm going to explain you a little bit more on the setup of the study, but we could definitely study measles immune suppression in humans in this uh, in this cohort, which was great. Um, so what we did is we had two different cohorts of people in this, uh, in this uh, study. Uh, and what we did is uh, we call them cohort A and cohort B. Again, it's not important for this presentation, but we included one cohort, which we call the early acute measles cohort. So these are children that had acute measles at the time that we had sampled them, and we sampled them for blood. And what we found is that um, there was a clear lymphopenia going on in these measles patients. So they have very low T cell numbers, but also very low B cell numbers, which was described before. But of course, we were interested in these memory uh, components. So we looked at the infections in memory cells, and what we found is that in the T cell component, there was not so much measles virus infection in the naive cells, but there was uh, way more infection in the memory cells, which was similar to what we had seen in the monkey. So it's really good that we could confirm that in humans that there was memory T cell infection going on. And again, similar to what we saw in the monkeys, is there was just uh, loads of B cell infection going on, independent of the, the subtype of measles, that, oh, sorry, of B cells that we were looking at. So the second cohort we had was a little bit more uh, special, and this was a really valuable cohort. So what we did in this cohort is we collected paired PBMC before and after measles. So this is not in the acute phase. So what we did in this cohort is we used uh, school children, and as soon as one child within a class had measles, we sampled all other children. So basically that means that we had pre-samples from hundreds of children which were exposed to one measles patient. And because measles is, is R0 of 12 to 18, almost all these children, of course, developed measles after being exposed to a measles patient. And we would then take follow-up samples. So that means that we had paired samples before and after measles. And of course, in those samples, we were going to compare the composition of the different lymphocyte subsets to see what's going on before and after measles. So what you see here in this graph, which is a bit complicated, is you see uh, the frequency or the relative frequency, I have to say, of different subsets 
before and after measles exposed, uh, expressed as a ratio. So everything that's a ratio of, one, of higher than one means that you have more of this subset after measles. If the ratio is lower than one, it means that you have less of this subset uh, after measles. And um, uh, for your convenience, I color-coded the ones that were significantly different. And red means that you have more of these cells, and green means that you have less of these cells. So you already see, if you look at the T-cells, there is some significant differences going on. But in general, um, you see that there's a loss of naive cells, naive cells, and a gain of memory cells. And of course, it's a little bit counterintuitive because I just told you that during measles, you probably lose your memory cells. So we had some trouble explaining this, but um, we, yeah, we are still working on this. But the working hypothesis is that the cells you've gained here in the memory comp uh, component and you've lost here in the naive cells is due to expansion of measles virus specific cells, which of course are also marked as memory cells. So it is a little bit difficult to, to study in this way which cells we are losing and which cells we are gaining. Well, same goes for CD8s. Uh, in the B-cell component, it was a little bit different. In general, there was a, a lymphopenia going on in the B-cell component, both in memory and, um, and naive cells, but it was mainly the CD27 and CD27 negative and positive IgG positive memory B-cells that were lost in the circulation. And we zoomed in a little bit more, and uh, the only thing I want to mark again is these B-cell subsets because they were really striking. It was really the different memory B-cell subsets expressing IgG and IgA that were lost in the circulation, and we saw many cells coming from lymph nodes, which are transitional B-cells that were replacing the loss of this subset. So uh, from this, we, uh, we hypothesis while well, this, this immune amnesia or loss of memory is going on in humans, but it seems to be more in the B-cell component than it is in the T-cell component. So the last piece of data I want to show you then, of course, if the, if the B-cell component is targeted, of course, the obvious question is what's going on with plasma cells and antibodies. So we looked at the antibody levels against different pathogens in these uh, measles patients before and after measles. We used a, uh, a systematic viral epitope scanning approach, which is known as reverse scan. It's an NGS approach, which basically measures antibodies to the whole virome. So any virus you can think about in, um, in, in serum samples. So, of course, we use this technique to compare pre and post measles samples. And, uh, well, this is a complicated technique, but I just want to show you some uh, slides. So, this is the repertoire, the antibody repertoire that's retained in different cohorts. We had two control cohorts. There was, uh, well, about 90% repertoire retained, which is normal in control cohorts. Uh, we had a measles negative cohort, and this was really the children in the classes. Well, the, the few children that did not develop measles, but these were proper controls. There was no loss of antibody repertoire, and we split the measles cases in a mild and severe cohort, and there was a clear loss of antibody repertoire in these, in these children going on. So there wasn't only a loss of memory B cells, there was also a loss of uh, memory repertoire. And I've also just put it in here as individual uh, per um, Per uh, participant basis, you see a clear loss of, of the antibody repertoire going on. And in the end, if we uh, if we uh, crunch the numbers, we found that measles virus infected children lose about 40% of their antibody repertoire after measles, really indicating that measles affects the uh, lung lymph plasma cells and memory B cell populations that produce these antibodies. And then the, the last data piece I want to show you before the discussion is that uh, it was quite interesting to see that. Um, these children also regained uh, a part of the immune repertoire after they recovered from measles. So what you see here is a clustering of the children that regained immunity against three different respiratory viruses, influenza virus, RSV, and endovirus. And we've clustered those either by postal code, school, or household. And what you see in red is the children that regained immunity, and in gray is the children that did not regain immunity to, for example, influenza virus. And you can see that the children that regained immunity were often clustered. So that means that respiratory viruses are also circulating in these, in these children after measles. And it seems that this circulation uh, leads to a gaining of immunity again uh, due to natural infections. And this was, of course, a little bit hypothetical and a difficult analysis. As a control, uh, we looked at non-respiratory viruses and we saw that only the respiratory viruses clustered spatially and the non-respiratory viruses did not. So it really is that the reconstruction of reconstruction of immune memory going on on a per pathogen basis in these uh, in these children. So I think there's a lot of uh, room for discussion here. So um, yeah, I just want to wrap up. Um, I've shown you that measles infects memory cells, how it destroys the lymphoid organs, and how different memory subsets are depleted after measles. 
Uh, but one of the important conclusions, of course, is that the antibody repertoire is significantly um, reduced after measles. So that means that these children really lost immunity after measles to different uh, pathogens. And that is reflected by the amount of infections that's going on uh, in these children after measles. And of course, uh, well, one of the questions we could ask at this point, but we have no time to look at this yet. And I think that's what Daniel or, or Ines already said, is how this affects, for example, SARS-CoV-2 specific immunity in this population and what's going on if there is a measles outbreak in populations with, uh, with immunity to respiratory viruses. Could be coronaviruses, but could be any, any other virus. And that's where, um, Daniel, I would like to uh, end this. I think it was a good overview of measles immune amnesia. Um, um, from there, there's loads of room for discussion. Okay, thank you very much for this excellent presentation. We have little time for uh, discussion. I just have one question. I, I will look at the chat. Uh, are the data on the correlation of age of onset of measles and or severity of the initial disease with the intensity and duration of the immune amnesia? So we we have tried to look at. Um, the combination of disease severity and the well, the severity of the immune amnesia, and we never found a real correlation. So it didn't seem that mild infections had less loss of antibody repertoire and uh, severe infections had a higher loss of antibody repertoire. So we couldn't really find that. It seems that there is no correlation between severity of disease and the amount of immune suppression, but it's also a very difficult topic to study. Mm -hmm. So I find it a difficult question to answer. Okay, uh, rapid question. Uh, about the non-specific protective effect of measles uh, vaccine, which are observed in uh, in uh, developing country from uh, Tina Severinsen, so she uh, she asked you whether you think that the uh, this uh, effect in measles vaccinated children uh, in terms of gain of uh, mortality are more related to what you just mentioned, or also uh, in part related to uh, vaccine non-specific effect. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question and a great topic of discussion. And it's also a heavy topic of discussion every time I present this, uh, <laughs> this data. So, of course, especially the, um, the uh, broader protective effect of measles virus is something that's hypothesized on quite often. We haven't studied it, so I, I don't want to make any speculations there. But what I do want to say is that um, we have extensively studied whether there's immune suppression or immune amnesia after measles vaccination. And that we can never find. So the measles vaccine is so attenuated that it definitely does not decimate your uh, memory populations or cause immune amnesia. So it would seem that if you prevent uh, measles by vaccination, at least you also prevent that these children develop uh, immune amnesia after measles. I mean, in the light of other non-protective effects of the measles vaccine, uh, uh, might actually be a very good thing to uh, to vaccinate. Okay, thank you very much. It's very reassuring. Uh, conclusion. Uh, if you can just answer rapidly the last question, which obviously comes from an epidemiologist, uh, it's uh, actually Noel Jill. If social disadvantage leads to lower vaccine uptake, surely the same disadvantage could increase the incidence of other infections subsequent to natural measles, measles and give the appearance of measles immune amnesia. I have to think a little bit kind of confusion effect of uh, uh, people who get the vaccine who are more at risk of other in respiratory infection due to the socioeconomical condition. Ooh, <laughs> I have to think a little bit about this and come back to it at the end. I so, think it cannot explain what you what you all show us. It may contribute uh, no. to, to, to a small effect. Uh, if yeah. I, if you allow me to answer in your, in your yes. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. I think it's time now to move to, to uh, our last speaker. Our last speaker is uh, Professor Jean Daniel Lelievre. He's an immunologist working at the Henri Mondor University Hospital of Créteil, where he's in charge of the clinical immunology and infectious disease department. He's a very active member of the French NITAG and is involved as an expert in many working group on vaccine, both at French and European level where he's a work package leader of several vaccine-related projects, especially on the HIV and COVID vaccine. Well, he will uh, talk about the role of immunology in supporting the design of vaccination strategy and, of course, using COVID-19 as an example. So uh, the floor is yours, Jean-Daniel.
Thank you, uh, Daniel, for this uh, very kind introduction, and thank you to to you and to Ines for the for the invitation. So I will give you a, a brief and global overview of uh, the um, SARS-CoV-2 immunology and show you how it could impact uh, the, the vaccine strategy on, against this virus. Here are my declaration of interest in the last four years. So uh, a multitude of factors are involved in the control of infection. Gen it generally considered that uh, humoral immunity is involved in the prevention here. Uh, of the infection, while the cellular immunity controls the evolution of the infection. The immunological analysis carried out in the phase two uh, uh, clinical trials, but also in the subsequent uh, uh, studies, mainly focused on the early phases of the uh, adaptive response, in particular on antibody uh, levels and also on effector uh, CD8 T, uh, T cells. Results obtained in non-human primate uh, models, uh, namely by the, the teams of Dan Baruch uh, in, the, in the US in uh, New York, showed that the antibody response is quite important for uh, uh, protection. And here you have the, the very nice dose effect, preventive effect of uh, uh, plasma from covalent uh, NHP infected by SARS-CoV-2. But they have shown also that C80 cells are also involved especially when the antibody levels drop in the blood. However, uh, there is another part of uh, the immune response that is quite important, meaning the memory uh, B cells. We have discussed in, in the previous uh, presentation on, on the relevance of the, those uh, population. And you can see that the naive B cell will give birth to germinal center uh, B cells, then to memory B cells and long live uh, plasma cells. The, the stimulation at the end of this uh, particular population through uh, vaccination will allow the production of more avid antibodies and having uh, what could be quite important in the setting of SARS-CoV-2 infection uh, uh, for, uh, of antibody that have uh, an efficacy against different strains. Therefore, Immune response, uh, understanding the evolution of memory population and the kinetics of viral replications are key elements in determining the, the relevance of a booster, booster dose. Indeed, the actors that are involved in controlling a new infection will depend on the, the type of viral strains. Is it different or identical to the one that have uh, infected you uh, in the past or other that uh, in, include in the vaccine? and the viral uh, replication kinetics. During SARS-CoV-2 infection, we have two kinds of uh, aspects. First of all, the appearance of variant of concern, and uh, more importantly for me, the rapid replication kinetics of uh, the, the virus leading to an infection in less than four or five, uh, five days. Therefore, vaccine strategy uh, um, must allow for optimal maturation of memory B cells and probably their mobilization by ad additional dose of vaccine, as their stimulation during reinfection is probably too slow uh, to uh, have a, a good increase uh, in the antibody level and then to block the infection. Mucosal response is also important, while it has been much less studied than the systemic response. You can see here a, a nice, uh, the results of the, uh, a nice a study performed by a French team in a Pasteur Institute in, in, uh, in Paris. And you can see that the, the uh, mucosal response uh, do not parallel uh, the systemic response. And you have four, uh, four different patterns. One, one type of uh, people uh, sharing uh, uh, antibody response at both levels, either um, systemic or, or at the mucosal uh, levels. Other in only one compartment, either systemic or mucosal, and other without any kind of antibody response. So the, the mucosal response is, could be uh, variable from individual one individual to another, correlated or not with these, the systemic response, and also with the severity of symptoms. And they also show in this uh, um, uh, experiment that it's correlated with the local microbiome. When it's present, it seems to, to persist uh, several months after infection, but we have uh, less data on what happened after vaccination, and I will show you 
the, the results later. The results from the phase, first uh, phase two clinical trials show that uh, the initial strategy with two vaccines appears to be very effective, at least for the a few months uh, following uh, the, the vaccination. However, several parameters question uh, this universal uh, two-dose strategy, uh, strategy with a fixed interval uh, for uh, the, the mRNA vaccine of one month. Indeed, the, the occurrence, for instance, of serious adverse events with adenoviral vector, vectors, the limited initial vaccine supplies, the occurrence of uh, variant of concern and the decrease in effectiveness uh, over time uh, have led to, to consider uh, other strategy uh, to try to face uh, this issue, either using heterologous prime boost strategy, considering a different strategy with pe for people with uh, an history of COVID-19 infection, uh, an increased interval between doses, the use of adapted uh, vaccine to the variants, and obviously, uh, the consideration of a booster dose, a third dose. While the uh, immunological basis for the use of uh, heterologous prime boost uh, strategy are poorly uh, deciphered, it seems that this kind of strategy uh, uh, presents several uh, advantages. The, the first one is to circumvent the problem of pre-existing uh, of vaccine-induced immunity with adenoviral vector, which is quite specific to this kind of vector. The second one is to increase the intensity of the immune response. The third one is to provide a, a different kind of immune response. And in, in this case, a CD40 cell help can be provided by a viral vector uh, used as a prime to a protein vector used as a boost. And it was the kind of strategy that had been used for the RV144 HIV vaccine trial. Finally, you can use different antigens in the two vaccines, and then you can diversify the, the response against viral strains while increasing the intensity of the immune response against the particular strains. And it was the strategy uh, adopted uh, by the GHG uh, for the Ebola vaccine. Outside COVID-19, uh, these strategies were widely used in settings where the immune response is complex to achieve, such as HIV, flu, or, or TB, and the large number of publications have shown their uh, advantage in terms of immunity and even in, in clinical efficacy with no particular safety uh, issues. To date, there, there are uh, two uh, kinds uh, of uh, vaccine with a, a marketing authorization leading on the prime boost heterologous strategy, uh, the G GNG Ebola vaccine, but also the, the pneumococcal vaccine strategy used in adults. So what, what are the, the, the results of uh, the, this kind of strategy uh, during COVID-19 vaccination? Immunological data have shown the, the value of this uh, strategy with uh, an increase in antibody response and uh, also an increase of T-cell response. You can see here uh, an example of uh, this kind of strategy with the, uh, uh, the AstraZeneca uh, vector as, uh, vaccine either as an homologous strategy here or here in red with the booster dose uh, with the Pfizer vaccine. You can see here the impact in terms of antibody response and here in T cell response of this different strategy. And just have a look here on the uh, dark blue or dark red uh, points, and you can see here that the heterologous strategy performed better in terms of inducing neutralizing antibody against either the historical strains or the, the variant of concern, and also have a clear impact in terms of inducing better T cell response. Real life data uh, have confirmed the positive impact of the strategy, but you have to keep in, in, in mind, as shown in animal models or with other vaccines, that the sequence. Uh, of the two vaccines are quite important. And currently, it seems that you have to use a, a, a viral vector as a prime and, and then an mRNA uh, 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 vaccine as a boost and not the opposite. Memory B cells uh, continue to mature post infection and uh, post uh, vaccination, and several teams have shown that the number of memory B cells increased. Uh, after uh, infection, 
but also after vaccination. Here you can see an, an example of this uh, publication. In blue, you have the SARS-CoV-2 naive population, and in red, the SARS-CoV-2 recovered population. And you can see here a quantitative aspect uh, of the, 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 the vaccination, showing that you will increase the number of memory B cells after uh, vaccination, while here you can see the qualitative ex, uh, aspect with an increase in hypersomatic mutation over time, suggestive of memory B cell um, uh, maturation. It's important to, to see that the, uh, both the quantitative and qualitative aspect of uh, uh, the, the memory B cell is different between after vaccination and after uh, infection with a better effect uh, of uh, the infection here. Extend the, the delay between those may improve uh, antibody uh, response by uh, acting on the memory B cells. The, the question of the optimal interval between the primary vaccination doses has been the subject of a large uh, debate and the difference between countries with UK uh, uh, preferring a, a, a longer in interval between the, the two doses. The, the issue here is the uh, obviously once again the maturation of the B cells and the formation of the, the germinal center, which could be impacted first of all by the distribution and the persistence of the vaccine. However, right now the uh, these, um, these points are poorly deciphered with the current mRNA and adenoviral vector, while we know that, uh, for instance, uh, the, the cheap adeno or adeno-26 may persist for, for long period in, in the body. It could be also by impact by the initial vaccine dose and dose uh, interval. Lower dose prime and long, uh, longer interval between doses could increase the selection stringency in the germinal center and allow the expansion of the higher affinity uh, uh, germinal center B cell selected, therefore improving the overall uh, response. However, you, you need to keep in mind that between the first two doses, uh, the, uh, the immune response is suboptimal, then you can could be uh, infected. So during a pandemic phase, it, it could not be uh, quite relevant to, to shorten the, the dose while the immunological uh, impact uh, is, uh, is clear. Uh, uh, what is the relevance of a booster dose? The booster dose may uh, mobilize uh, this uh, memory uh, B cell, and it has been uh, clearly shown that the realization of the booster dose uh, uh, six months after the, the, uh, the second dose with an mRNA vaccine will increase the, the rate and the diversity of the neutralizing antibody without the need of a use of a vaccine adapted to the, the, the variant of concern. It has been demonstrated here for the, the Pfizer vaccine with an, an increase in the, the level uh, of the antibody after the, uh, the booster dose and, and for uh, the uh, Moderna vaccine. And here you can see uh, the, the level of antibody before the, the dose, booster dose with uh, very low neutralizing antibody against uh, the different variant of concern here the the the, the, the beta and gamma uh, uh, book and then after the booster dose a clear impact and increase of uh, this neutralizing uh, antibody against different uh, strains including the delta variant Finally, what, what could be the, the impact uh, on, on uh, um, people that have been infected uh, previously by the SARS-CoV-2? Uh, the use of second dose quickly following the, the first one in those subjects uh, clearly uh, seems to have no uh, effect on, on B cell response. You can see here uh, uh, the impact of, of the first dose on the neutralizing antibody uh, uh, against the, either the, the historical strains or here uh, the, the beta strains, and you can see here a, a clear impact of the first uh, the first uh, vaccination, while the second seems to have uh, clearly no impact. The, these uh, uh, second dose could have either no impact or even a deleterious impact on the T cell response. Here you can see. Uh, the, the, uh, here in red, uh, the impact of the first dose and the no impact of, this, uh, of the second dose, but other teams have shown that you have a, a clear decrease of uh, the, the second dose in uh, people that have recovered from 
uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection. The use of longer interval could be interesting. However, uh, the antibody level before the second dose remain high, questioning uh, its clinical uh, relevance. Finally, uh, uh, is the, the analysis of the T cell response could also help us to, to think uh, about a uh, new uh, vaccine uh, strategy. It has been shown that the, the post-infection T cell response is quite large, covering more than 1,400 epitopes from several proteins. Therefore, uh, it could be interesting to add other protein in future vaccine that could also uh, target a more diverse uh, uh, T cell uh, epitopes. Moreover, we know currently that the, the B and T epitopes of, uh, on the spike are different. Here you can see in red uh, the immunodominant region of the CD4 T cells uh, on, the, on the spike protein, while the, the B cells epitopes are represented in yellow. And these epitopes are, are clearly uh, uh, different. And what, what does it mean? It means that the, uh, the, the variant of concern that are characterized by mutation on B cells epitopes are still uh, sensitive uh, to, to the T cell response against other strains. Finally, uh, we, uh, several teams have shown that uh, the vaccine given systematically, and namely the, the mRNA vaccine, may have an impact on the mucosal response and they are able to induce uh, uh, mainly IgG but also IgGA associated with the sun secretory component meaning that there is a local production of IgG, uh, IgA it's not a passive transfer from systemic um, uh, response. We don't know exactly uh, right now, the, the persistence and the evolution of this mucosal response after vaccination. However, uh, results from the, the kinetic of viral replication of people that have been uh, infected when they have been uh, vaccinated showed there is, that there is a decrease of uh, uh, the impact of the vaccination on viral. Here you can see the, uh, the the, the, the difference between the viral load on people that have been infected and vaccinated compared to people that have been uh, infected without any history of vaccination. And you can see that you have a fold a four decrease in the viral load uh, shortly after vaccination and that this uh, effect uh, will go down uh, with, uh, with time. However, the use of a booster dose will increase the impact and it means that probably you, you may also increase the mucosal response, response with the booster dose. Therefore, therefore uh, I hope to, uh, to have shown you that several parameters uh, that question uh, the, the universal two dose strategy with a fixed and thermal uh, could, uh, could be solved with uh, immunological uh, analysis of the immune response either after infection or after uh, uh, vaccination. Uh, although the, those uh, results, those immunological uh, results are not substitute for a clinical efficacy obtaining clinical trial, they may provide mechanistic support for modulating initially COVID vaccine strategy regarding the use, first of all, uh, uh, of a single dose in subject with a history uh, of infection, uh, which is currently the recommendation, at least in France. Uh, an extent intervention uh, uh, period between the two initial doses. However, you you have uh, is here the issue of being infected between the two doses, the the, the, the use of heterologous prime boost strategy, and finally uh, the use of a lead uh, third uh, booster dose. Uh, that uh, strategy, uh, which four of them, of them have been currently shown their clinical relevance. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Daniel, for this excellent presentation. I think we we are lucky we have been uh, given uh, a 10 minutes extension for our session, so uh, we have time for, for a few questions. Um, if I may start waiting for more questions to arrive, um, I was wondering, uh, Jean-Daniel, how much did all the data and knowledge uh, that have been now accumulated uh, both on the SARS-CoV-2 virus and the response to a marketed vaccine, 
um, allow us to predict the need for repeated boosters in the likely hypothesis of uh, endemization of the virus? <laughs> I, I think it's quite a, a difficult answer because, uh, as mentioned by uh, Danuta, th there is also uh, immunological aspect that, that will impact the, the need for uh, for booster dose. Uh, SARS-CoV-2 is is quite a, a new vaccine, but uh, I, I did not discuss in my presentation, for instance, the cross reactive activity with the the, uh, um, the other coronavirus, uh, while for the immoral part, it seems that it, it will not impact uh, the, the protection uh, to, uh, to SARS-CoV-2. There are several teams that, that have shown that uh, the T-cell response against um, uh, the other coronavirus may impact uh, the, the protection uh, against SARS-CoV-2. SARS so we, we don't have uh, uh, right now the, the, the global picture and to uh, to predict how many uh, booster doses we, we will need. I, I think currently uh, uh, with uh, uh, the, the third dose uh, giving a part, six months apart after the, the two one, we, we have this very uh, uh, large and interesting mobilization of the, the memory B cell uh, population. We don't know exactly the kinetic of the decrease of the antibody uh, following this uh, uh, this booster dose, and we can imagine that if this uh, kinetics is quite uh, um, is quite low, we will be protected for uh, for for many uh, many years. Obviously, uh, a, a new virus can uh, can uh, can occur, but we, we can discuss uh, this with uh, with Rory and and Danuta. There is an equilibrium for for the virus. Uh, um, um, to uh, to be able to uh, to to infect the um, the, the body and and to to deal with the immunological response and the the rate of mutation uh, is lower for uh, for SARS-CoV-2 than for, uh, for for flu and there, there are only few the the, the, the antibody that uh, the neutralizing antibody against the virus uh, are quite uh, are quite narrow so I, I think. I'm not sure that we will have in the uh, the next month in the in, in the very uh, uh, in near future uh, the occurrence of uh, uh, um, a virus stand that could uh, uh, overpass uh, the the current uh, immunological uh, response to the virus. Okay, thank you. Uh, we received a question from uh, Joseph Wiggle. Uh, given the immune repertoire after WV, so I guess it's. Uh, while the virus infection, what vaccination? What vaccination could really add? So, my understanding of the question is: uh, Is it really need necessary to uh, propose uh, uh, even one dose after a natural infection? I, I think, uh, and it's a recommendation in France. Uh, we recommend to only uh, give one uh, vaccination uh, after infection. For, for me, there, there is no need to have uh, these two uh, two dose regimen as for uh, for, for naive uh, for, for naive in, in individual because with only one shot you are going to mobilize all the B and T cell res, uh, res, uh, repertoire and the, the the use of an, an additional dose uh, is quite uh, immunologically not relevant. Uh, some teams uh, and one team from uh, from the UK have shown that if you uh, give this uh, second dose uh, not one month after the, the first one, but four months after the, the first one, you will increase uh, the, uh, the antibody level, which is quite normal because you are going to, to mobili mobilize once again uh, the, your memory uh, B cells. However, the, the, the level of the antibody is, is, is still uh, quite uh, ele elevated. So, for me, there is no clinical uh, relevance of use of a second dose in, in those populations. Okay, thank you. Waiting for more questions, if any, I will ask you a second question. Um, how much the, the current finding uh, will apply in your mind to the forthcoming vaccine based on other platforms, such as, for instance, the recombinant adjuvanted vaccine soon to come? So, so do we have to start again? Do we have to start again all the studies to? Uh, adapt the vaccination strategy or how much we can rely on what has been shown with the mRNA vaccine 
we can apply, we will be able to apply them on uh, other vaccines. Uh, it, it's uh, I think. Uh, it's different. Uh, it it depends where where you're going to to um, to use this, this vaccine. Uh, in in uh, in Europe, for for instance, everybody will uh, will have been vaccinated with the uh, the, the, the mRNA and uh, adenoviral uh, vectors. So, uh, for instance, the, the use of Novavax or Sanofi vaccine, which which are protein vaccine, will be used as a booster dose. And we know, uh, if you, if you look, uh, for instance, at all that have been published uh, for in, in the setting of HIV vaccine, that uh, the use of a protein vaccine uh, as a, a booster dose is quite relevant. It will be quite different if you use this kind of vaccine uh, in other country with naive uh, naive population. And for me, I think the uh, the, the efficacy of a protein vaccine in a SARS-CoV-2 infection is lower than mRNA. Uh, or, or, uh, or adenoviral vector because I think the, the, the induction of this response is quite relevant and may protect at, um, may, maybe against uh, at least uh, uh, the, the severe form of, of the disease. Okay, thank you. I don't see any, any other questions, so probably it's now time to close the session and invite you to, to follow the poster tools uh, which are to follow immediately. Thank you very much for the three speakers for having made su such complex immunological consideration so clear for us poor epidemiologists. Thank you to the other audience for your active contribution and thank you of course for your audience for having organized such an exciting session. So have a nice day and see you another time. Bye bye.